Hello everybody, welcome back. Pastor Bob from Place of Refuge. Today, the title I have, The Wounds of a Friend. We're going to see some things about Christ, what he said, and, and we'll go through there. So, we're going to be in Matthew 8, verses 18 through 22. Now, when Jesus saw the great multitudes about him, he gave a commandment to depart from the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not nowhere or where to lay his head. In verse 21, and another disciple said to him, Lord, suffer me to first go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Wow, there's <laughs> it almost sounds pretty harsh, isn't it? So we're gonna we're gonna look at this. Now, now the reason I wrote or uh, read verse 18 is because I want you to get the picture here. It, he was about ready to leave. said, let's go to the other side. And about that time, this certain scribe came. All right? So the scribe here was a man learned in the Mosaic Law. Um, and I, I wrote this down because it's important. Mosaic Law and Sacred Writings. It was also an interpreter, a teacher. Scribes examined the more difficult and subtle questions of the law. So basically, they're the, supposed to be the experts. I will follow. This is what he said. I'll join with you as a disciple. I'll side with your party. And I'll join him as an attendant. So those are all what I will follow means. Whether you go, whether so whether, in case or wherein or which or what, whether, I'm going to be with you. And Jesus said to him, he explained to him, that, uh, well, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests. The Son of Man has not nowhere to lay his head. Now, all the foxes have a lair. That's if you look at it in the Greek, it says they have a lair. They have a place. Of course, birds have a nest. That's obvious. But the Son of Man has not nowhere to lay his head. Now, so what, Christ was really painting a picture of what discipleship really is. You know, what condition, walk, what, what walk of life, you know. It wasn't glamorous. You know, me being a pastor, you know, <laughs> being a pastor... It, it's an admirable thing, but it's not glamorous. I mean, maybe some people think it is. I mean, I love doing it, but it's like, you know, nowadays, you know, the Christians, you know as well as I do, they don't like it too much anymore. So we're laughing stock for the most part. I'm not, you know, I'm not upset by no stretch. It's just the way it is. So, it, you know, it wasn't lucrative. So I don't, we don't know if this scribe maybe had a, you know, undermined idea that maybe he'll be famous or get along with the group, but we don't know that. But he was just said. He didn't tell him, look, I don't have no place to lay my head or anything. So I'm sure there's a lot more spiritual significance to the scribe than what we know. We'll find out when we get to heaven. Then it says this. Now this is interesting. And another of his disciples. First one was a scribe. He said, another one of his disciples said to him, suffer me to first go and bury my father. Now that disciple here, I want to tell you what it means. It means a learner, a pupil, a disciple, obviously. It's an interesting that this word for disciple is the same Greek word used for the 12 apostles or disciples. And let me give you a side scripture for that. It's Matthew 8, 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. All right, that's a whole different story. But it's the word disciple is the same as it is here. So this guy was actually something, you know, to do with Jesus, it seems like. All right, suffer me first. In other words, permit me, allow me to give leave. That's what it means, to bury my father. Now that means to inter, uh, the, you know, when they bury somebody, in the, like in a mausoleum or, a, you know, the interment, they call that interment. All right, so it means to bury and inter. Now, so what word could we think, this one guy said, well, you know, I, you know, he didn't say anything after he said he did, you know, when Jesus told me he didn't have, you know, foxes have layers and birds have nests and so forth. But this one, this one says, suffer me, or permit me to go bury. Now, so... What we have here is procrastination, my friend. You know, I'm sure that we've all done it. Let me tell you what the Greek, or not the Greek dictionary, but the Webster's dictionary reads. It says procrastination. To put off intentionally and habitually. To put off intentionally the doing of something that shall be done. In other words, you, you know, it's always good to procrastinate sometimes. And sometimes there's wisdom in it. Well, let's hold off because of this or something. But a lot of times, you know, if you ever met with somebody, you know, you'll ask them to do something, and they'll say, well, let me pray about it first. And you're thinking, well, look, I'm just asking you to do this one little task. you got to pray about it? 
Okay, I agree we pray about stuff, but you know sometimes they're doing it purposely just to, to you know, maybe try to get out and find, find somebody else. Procrastination, there's wisdom behind it sometimes if you're waiting on something and waiting on the Lord. That's really not procrastination. That is, is the, the interpretation. If you're waiting on the Lord, now you're just waiting on the Lord. That's a whole different ballgame. Anyway, so now it, there were those, you know, when I study, I look at other people's work from years ago back in the 1800s. I think I've said this before to you. So there are those that believe that he wasn't sick to the point of death. So it might have been a long time. You know, I mean, like, let's say your mom or dad's living with you. Well, let me, you know, bury my mom and dad. Or let, let, wait till they die, and then I'll follow you. You know, Christ, you know, he is very simply, God needs to be first in everything. That's the intention here. Is he being insensitive? No. The cost of discipleship is, is very, it, it's costly, believe me. So, you know Jesus in Exodus 20, verse 12, it says, Honor your father and mother. So he would never violate his scripture. So there was more to it than that. Again, possibly the, it was a big procrastination. We'll find out when we get there. Then he says this. But Jesus said to him, follow me. I laid that groundwork for this. And let the dead bury their dead. Now that almost sounds really cruel. In, in, um, you know, and I'm not judging our Lord. I mean, most people on the surface level would think, wow, that's pretty insensitive. Well, let me tell you what the word dead means. Okay, it does mean spiritually dead. I want you to think about that. Destitute of life that recognizes and devoted to God because given over to what? Trespasses and sin. Let me insert this. It says, but Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the spiritually dead, those destitute of a life that recognizes and is devoted to God. In other words, they don't, they don't care. Because given up to trespasses and sins, Bury their spiritually dead destitute of life that recognizes and is devoted God because he's given up the trespasses. You know, it sounds like a play on words here, but it's pretty heavy stuff. In other words, let the spiritually dead bury those that are spiritually dead. Now again, God's not being insensitive to mother and father. He wants us to, to honor them. You and I are going to give an account for what we've done. I know, you know, that's not a pleasant thought, but it's true. Here's what it says in Proverbs 21, 16, talking about wandering out of the way. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in what? The congregation of the dead. That's a scary thought. So, you know, there are people that will make excuses. Oh, I can't do this because and all that. And I get it. And I'm not saying, you know, there's some legitimate reason. But what Christ was trying to point out there is the, the idea of procrastination. Where's your heart? Amen. Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. Now that's a fact. Faithful means to nurture or establish, to build up and support. Their trustworthiness are the wounds of the bruises. My Greek word dictionary explained it like this. Wounds, on the other hand, physical or emotional, may serve a good purpose. I agree with that, but I want to clarify something. It's not inflicting physical, physical violence on them. That's not what we're talking about here, you know. It's, it, they're not advocating, let's hurt somebody. No. The wounds here is a bruise, and it's not hurt. It, you know, bruise hurts, but the truth hurts is basically what we're getting. You know, we say that today, the truth hurts. It does. But we always need to be Christ-like when we try to exhort somebody. Amen? You don't want to just tell somebody, oh, you're this, and you, you kind of pick up a flaw on them. And you come out and say, well, I'm just being honest. Well, no, you're being rude. That's not what we're talking about here. But a lot of times, you know, when I was young, you know, I made a commitment to the Lord when I was about 18 years old. And I wasn't living for the Lord because I wasn't disciple, but I thought I was all set. And it was my brother-in-law at the time. He quoted a scripture. Now, we're talking back in the 70s. And it hit home. Did he mean and intentionally to hurt my feelings? No, he didn't. But the faithful of the wounds of a friend, when it said it, it changed my life. That was my beginning. I need to walk worthy of what I'm doing. It clicked. Amen? It say the kisses, or it, 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 they, to, it shows a false sense of, of affection. You know, they're, just, they're just kissing up to you. They're lying to you. I want you to think back. How did Judas betray Jesus? Think about it. All right? So the kisses are those the false show of affection 
of an enemy, that means that the enemy means to be hateful, to be unwilling. The word really means to hate God or person. These kisses here from an enemy are what? They're deceitful. They become abundant. They're being plentiful to make a larger abundancy. Here it also means a sense of being alluring or deceitful. And that's what it really means, alluring or deceitful. Now, was he being was Christ being deceitful when he was talking to the scribes? No. And the other disciple, no, he wasn't. It was faithful to wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. Now here we're going to come up to another thing. I want to show you something. In Matthew 28, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end the world. Now this is after Christ's resurrection. Okay, so we, this is a charge, if you will. Alright, so the eleven, they went up away. Now, no, look at verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now you believe that? With all what they've been through? The word doubted means here to waver, but it also means to hesitate. Now my word Greek study said this. Now, I want you to understand something. The word of God is is, is very dear and sacred to me. All right, but there are some things that, that may, it should have been they hesitated, opposed to doubted. Now, we do know they could use doubted because doubting Thomas, he was one we know. Isn't that something? How, how about that legacy? So they hesitated, some doubted. So, you know, I mean, this, is, this has never happened before. You know, resurrection from the dead, virgin births, all that stuff. It sounds to the world, it sounds absurd, but to us, we know it's true. Then Jesus said and spake unto all power. What? He said, and Jesus spake unto all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. That's true. Now that word power, in the Greek, it's a word called exosia. This is a powerful word. It's the power of authority and right of privileges. The power of him who, whose will and commands must be submitted to by others and obey. So all power is given to me. So that exosia, how could you, how could we, you know, liken that today? It's like our police officer. <clears throat> I don't care if the police officer is six foot seven, uh, you know, a, a bodybuilder, or you got a female officer that may be in smaller stature, but they're every bit as powerful, and they have the state behind them. That's that exosia. You know, when they stand out in the middle of the road, I don't care who it is, they got that uniform on, you stop, because there's a warning going on. Or when they turn the blues on, you stop. Right? That's that exosia. They have the authority of the state to do that. Praise the Lord. And I'm glad and I'm grateful for them. And then he tells them to do this. Go therefore and teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Go ye means go from one place to another. Folks, my friends, we're all going to give an account for what we've done. And there's going to be times that it's not convenient to go. But believe me, it's worth it. You know, it implies motion from one place to another. To do what? To teach all nations. You know, Place of Refuge has, we have missionaries all over the world. Because of the faithfulness of our people, we support people in China, <clears throat> Philippines, Guatemala, Haiti, and then we have missions. I know I'm missing some here. We have some home missions too. And it's, you know, and it makes a big difference. So they're teaching all nations, amen? But it says to baptize them. You know, when you see baptism, if you've never been baptized, I'd encourage you to be baptized because that's what God was. You, you believe and be baptized. It means to immerse and submerge in, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, it does say to, do, to dip repeatedly. And I always make and sport of some people at church here. I like to tease and say, you know, I wish I'd have known that before I baptized you. I'd have really held you under, dipped you a few times. I was just kidding them. But it does mean to dip because it's used in other places. All right. So, verse 20. To do what? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all, even unto the end of the world. Now, when you say teaching them to observe, this, this word is full of wonderful things. Observe means to attend to carefully, take care of, watch, and guard. You need to do that. What? This commandment is commanded to be done. And lo, I am with you always. 
Now, that's hard sometimes. You know, you're in a scary situation. Is God with you? He is. And I know you feel like you're alone, but you're not. Lo, I'm with you means I'm with, I'm after, I'm behind. It strictly implies motion forward, the middle, or into the midst of something. Isn't that cool? Is Christ in the midst when we two or more together? Of course he is. Amen. And also motion after a person or thing, i.e. either as to follow and be with a person or to fetch a person or thing, even to what? The end of the world. You know, how many know that there is a big revival going on down in Kentucky and it's spreading through all the campuses all over our country? Praise the Lord. I, we live in Fowlerville, Michigan. I'm praying it comes here. We're ready for it. Hey, you never know what God's going to want. Now, so here's, I've got like four points here on what disciples will do. Number one, a disciple will submit to the Lord. All right? Submit to the Lord. I have Colossians 2, 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. And that means walk. It's a way of life. It means to regulate your life, conduct yourself in what? The newness of life. And that's what's used here in Colossians 2, 6. So, number one, submit to the Lord. You know, a disciple will submit to the Lord. Number two, they'll go public with their witness. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Well, you know, I've done some study on that, in season and out of season. You know what it really means? <laughs> Either way, you got to be out of season, you still need to do it. When you're in season, you still need to do it. No excuse type thing, you know. And I'm paraphrasing that, but if you look it up, you'll see that I'm correct. So they go public with their witness. Number three, they are available for training. Hebrews 5.14, that strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, that even those who by reason of, of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. A lot of, a lot of time in the newer translation, that word exercise will be changed to train. They, they're trained to discern both good and evil. When I like the exercise, it means to vigorously exercise it anyway, either body or mind. Use your senses. Why? To discern both good and evil. Amen. You know, what's it say? Now, this one, you know, it's for children, but there's a point made here. Proverbs 22 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he gets old, he will not depart from it. For those of you who are older saints, you probably went to Sunday school or whatever that, and you learned about the Bible. And, there, and as you get older, you can start applying those principles. That's what train it. It will not depart. Now, let me let me encourage some of you. Let's say you have children and grandchildren that backslid. All right? Hang on to this. But also, I have a side note. My, I didn't say this to my church. But Philippians 1 6. Hang on to this. You folks that got prodigals, I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work is able to perfect it. So Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 1 6. Now, that, I didn't have that in my message, but that's how you do. Yeah, you train them, you did everything, you maybe even send them to Christian school, and they go into the universities, now they come back and they're not serving the Lord. Let me tell you something, it's instilled. You can't lie to yourself, you didn't know anything about Jesus Christ. Believe me, I know. <laughs> train means to dedicate, inaugurate, and train them. All right, so that's what they do, all right? And that was point number three. Let's see, what was number three. They're available for training. All right, now number four, they understand the godly virtue, and this is so important, of accountability. Their accountability in Webster's describes it as an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's action. A lot of times, sometimes I use the American language to um, complement the Greek, all right? So to even make it into a better thing, I'm going to give you some side scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.10, where we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it be what? Good or evil, or bad, excuse me. All right? So there's accountability. Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, what's going to happen? They've got to deny themselves, take up his cross, and follow me. Now we're going to get into that in a minute. So hang on to 2 Corinthians 5, 10. All right. Let's move on. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said unto who? His disciples, a learner, a pupil. But it also means much more. It is one who accepts the instruction given to him, oh, I love this, and makes it his rule of conduct. 
Is the Bible your rule of conduct? I hope and pray it is. It's, it's going to protect you from all kinds of stuff. doesn't mean that Christians won't have problems, but he delivers us out of them all. If any man will come, whoever, whatever, it, it's, it, it's anybody. Now that word man here, it means also whoever. It's both uh, men and women. Let him or deny himself or lose sight of oneself and owns interest. you got to put your own interests away a lot of times. Himself here is also himself or herself, itself or themselves. So it's both men and women, everybody. Pick up his cross. You know, his also, himself, here for him, and themselves. So it's both men and women. So what do you think about when you think about the cross? The cross is, as you know, it denotes the whole passion of Christ. No pun intended with the movie. And meant of his sufferings and death. That's exactly what it said in my record. So our cross would be what we're enduring for the sake of Jesus Christ. Our missionaries, believe it or not, over other countries, not so much mine that we're supporting, but other in parts of the country, they're being murdered, crucified. They're being sold into slavery. It's just all heinous. You know, that's their cross. Ours might be something different. It means that when we suffer, not to give up and quit. It's easy to quit. Anybody can quit. Don't give up. It's worth it. God's going to reward you. Amen? Take up your cross and what? Follow Jesus. Follow me. Verse 25. And then it says this. And you know, a lot of times we want to save our life. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. That's a good scripture. That word save means to keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction. If you do that, you try to hide, put yourself in a bucket or whatever and hide and think because you're afraid, you'll lose it. It render useless, be lost, to ruin, put out of the way entirely. But whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it, will come upon, meet with, fall with, and learn and discover. And go verse 26. For what is a man that profit if he should gain the whole world? What? And lose his soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Can I answer that for you? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. There's only one thing. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. You accept the Lord, and then, you know, he's going to forgive you of all your sin. You're going to live for him eternally. Let us, you know, I could have called this the cost of discipleship. It's, it's greater. But the wounds of a friend, you know, and like I say, when you, ex, you know, exhortate somebody with exhortation, don't, don't, you know, pick a flaw and say, you know, I can't believe you did it. No, you're, you're supposed to do it out of love. Now, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Jesus Christ told him, it, he told them the truth. He said, foxes, you know, they have holes, birds have nests. And he said, let the dead bury the dead. He was trying to just bring a point on procrastination. All right? Well, God bless you. I hope this ministered to you. Let's pray. Father, bless each and every one that are listening to this. Father, myself and Tuna, we all can do more for you. So I pray you bless them, strengthen them, encourage them, and give you praise in Jesus' name. Your glory. Amen. God bless you, my friend. I'll see you next week.